All right, thank you, Carl. Good morning, everyone. So it has been a while since I've seen you guys. So I was here last week, but I've been on the road for five weeks with my work and with my family. So it's so good to be back in the house of the Lord with you. And I didn't think when I was on vacation that I was going to end up in this preaching rotation. Uh, But Pastor Tim really knows how to run a business. And obviously, you know, Nick gave me a great, great word. Say that word you gave me, the volunteer. Yeah, voluntold. I've been, instead of volunteering to preach, I've been voluntold to to (laughs) preach. But here's what I want to, I guess, share with you guys uh, this morning is that, you know, I make the point that when I first got up here to share my sermon a few weeks back, it was more of a testimony of my life. And, And I shared with you guys that I didn't really have a desire necessarily to get up on stage and preach. And I still don't necessarily have a huge desire to be up here today. But I think it's appropriate that I mention this again because the title of today's sermon is The Flesh Versus the Spirit. And my challenge to you today is if you take nothing else away from my sermon this morning, nothing else, that you would be challenged to step out of your comfort zone in the next days and weeks in your life to step out of your comfort zone and put yourself in a position where you can be used by the Spirit, to step outside of your comfort zone and lean into the Spirit that He might use you because the reality is, is what keeps me from sharing this morning or preaching this this morning is the flesh, is whether it's my laziness and not wanting to prepare my ego and what people will think of me, whatever it is, that's the flesh in my life. And I challenge you this morning, I mean, for example, you might think I can't teach in Sunday school because I'm not qualified. I'm not, and we're desperate for teachers in Sunday school. I'm going to throw that out there. We're desperate for teachers to teach in Noah's Ark. And you might be thinking, I'm not qualified. What we're going to learn today is that you don't have to be qualified because it's the spirit that will empower you to accomplish that. And so my challenge is, as we go through this passage today, and they gave me such a long passage, uh, it was super difficult to figure out what am I going to do in walking through this passage and what am I going to share that I've taken out in my research and study and listening to people that I want to share today. And first what I want to do is I want to recap for us something that Pastor Tim taught us last week because I think it's important because he taught us in chapter 5 of Galatians, he talked through verse 1 through 15, he talked about how we now have freedom from the law in Christ. And if you remember at this point in Galatians, Paul is writing to the church here saying, guys, stop, he's angry, stop, stop trying to preach and believe in a false gospel because it's not the law that saves you, it's the work of Christ that saves you. And there's a temptation that happens in my own life every single day. The temptation in my life is I try to build processes in my life to drive success whether it's the three steps to become a millionaire, the three steps to greatest health, or the three steps to get myself into heaven. So I'm not surprised that the church of Galatians finds themselves in this situation to where Paul has come, shared the gospel with them, has gone on his way, but yet now they're back into this place where they are trying to earn their salvation. And Paul is frustrated and and kind of angry and writing to them. And as Pastor Tim taught us last week, saying, guys, we are free from the law because of Christ. And we learned that the good news of Christ is a call to freedom from the law. And we learned that the only thing that counts is our faith expressing itself through love. And that the whole law can be fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. This was an amazing truth. And so we should have walked out of last sermon feeling empowered and free that, hey, I'm no longer subject and under the pressure of the law, which is true. But I didn't walk out of last sermon that way. And I don't know if it's because I was already thinking on this topic, it probably was, but Pastor Tim, I don't know if he even remembers, closed his sermon by saying that, In this new freedom, we're called to love. 
And we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. And Pastor Tim shared that in order to love your neighbor as yourself, you have to sacrifice because that's the example that Jesus gave. And I walked out of last sermon going, my gosh, yes, I'm free from the law because Christ has paid my debt, but I still have to live in this love of loving your neighbor as yourself. And guys, I can't even love one person like myself. If you want proof of this, talk to my wife, Megan, who's teaching Sunday school, and she will tell you, I have not even been successful with one person, the person who's closest to me, the person you would think, oh, I can definitely do it for them. I haven't even been successful in in following through and being able to have this faith that is genuine enough to give this love that is qualified enough to love your neighbor as yourself. And why do I share this? I walk out of this when I hear this, that I need to love my neighbor as myself, I get discouraged. And it's not an emotional necessary discouragement. It's more of a discouragement of this is impossible. This is an impossible task to be able to fulfill and love my neighbor as myself. And that's why I believe Paul wrote this last verse in the last 16 through 26 that we're going to go over today. That's why he wrote this. Because Paul's answer to this discouragement that is in my mind of going, how am I, even though I'm free from the law, how am I going to actually love my neighbor as myself? The secret is learning to walk by the Spirit. See, what we're going to learn today, that if the Christian life looks too difficult for you right now, you were never meant to live the Christian life alone. You were never meant to live the Christian life on your own power. When you're saved by the grace of Jesus, he gives you the spirit, which is a helper that's there to guide, direct, and convict you. And we must live it by the spirit of God, the command of this love that he's giving us is not a legalistic command. It's not a command that now I have to love my neighbor as myself to earn my salvation. What he's saying is this love will happen freely in my life if I live by the Spirit. It's not a legalistic rule for me now. It's something that will actually happen freely in my life if I live by the Spirit. And so what I want to do to tackle this huge passage of Scripture is I want to answer three questions today. I want to answer what is walking by the Spirit. I want to answer why is it crucial to walk by the Spirit, because is this something that's optional? And then I want to answer what I believe to be the most important, which is how do you walk by the Spirit? Because if you're anything like me, especially growing up in church, you come to church on Sunday and your your feet hit the floor on Monday morning, and you're confused because you don't know how to apply the truth that you just learned practically in your life. So I want to talk about how. So instead of reading the scripture again because Carl read it, let's dive right in for the sake of time into answering the first question, which is what is walking by the Spirit? So when I hear that we're called to walk by the Spirit of God, the first thing I think of is what do I have to do? Right? I don't know if that's where you guys find yourself. I find myself, if I'm walking, I obviously must be going somewhere, so I need to find the road that I'm supposed to be at, the point in time that I'm supposed to be at, and what I'm actually supposed to be doing. But I think there's two clues that Paul gives us in this text that shed light on the meaning of what he means by walking by the Spirit. The first is in verse 18. So chapter 5, verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. See, Paul could have written here, If you follow the Spirit, you are not under the law. And I'm not saying that's not true. That might be true, that if you follow the Spirit, you're not under the law. But he specifically chose to say, if you are led by the Spirit, you are under the law. Because where does that put the emphasis? That puts the emphasis on the Spirit leading, not the emphasis on your ability See, this is critical. I know this is maybe a simplistic point, but it's very critical that we understand when we're trying to determine what is walking by the Spirit, we have to determine where is the emphasis. The emphasis on this is if you are led, meaning the Spirit is the one that has the power. The Spirit is the one that will enable you to walk in the Spirit. And so, guys, there was a great example that I read when I was researching this, that said the Spirit of Christ is not like the pace car that sets the pace that races. So if we have any race car fans, Daytona 500 or something like that, they have this pace car that sets the pace for all the cars, and the cars follow along. 
That's not like the Spirit of God. That's not like the, uh, the leadership of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is more like a locomotive on a train, meaning the train engine is pulling all of the other carts behind it on the way it should go. What I'm trying to make the point of here is that walking by the Spirit of God is actually not in our power. It's something that we need to couple just like a train couples together and the Spirit will guide you. It's in His power that will enable us to do this. The second point I think that Paul gives us a clue on what it means to walk by the Spirit of God is in the verse Galatians 5, 22 through 23. This is probably the most popular in this text that we all know, which is the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, if our Christian walk is to be a walk, of love, joy, and peace, which we would all probably agree that it is, then walking by the Spirit must mean we bear fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to say that again, because it's very simplistic. But if the Christian life and Christian walk is supposed to be a walk that has love, joy, and peace in it, then Walking by the Spirit, which is what we're trying to determine the answer to today, must mean bearing the fruit of the Spirit. How do we know if Pastor Tim walks by the Spirit? We know he walks by the Spirit because he's bearing the fruits of the Spirit. And I think Paul is drawing from the imagery that he, Jesus talked about in John 15, 4 through 5. See, in John 15, 4 through 5, he said, Abide in me, this is Jesus talking, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So what is the point? Walk by the Spirit means Abide in the vine. Keep yourself securely united to the living Christ. Cut, don't cut yourself off from the flow of the Spirit. The main point I'm trying to make with these two passages and what Paul is saying is my temptation when I read this verse is to believe that walking in the Spirit is there's a list in this verse of do's and there's a list in this verse of don'ts. In my version of walking in the Spirit, as Luke Acri is waking up and going, okay, to walk in the Spirit, I need to check my list and, and not do sexual immorality, not do drunkenness, not do envy, not do these things. And I also need to act out on love. What the passage is telling us here is that walking in the Spirit is not in my power. Walking in the Spirit is simply abiding, and we're going to get to what it means to practically abide in Christ, but just abiding in Christ, and He's the one that will give me the power to overcome sexual immorality. He's the one that will empower me to have love in my life. This is a key point that I want to make sure that I drive home, that the temptation in our lives is to think, okay, we have to abide in the Spirit, so I have to walk out here and start doing love and start doing joy, and I have to come out here and say no to temptation. The, but the key here is abide in Christ. We have to wake up and abide in Christ. And He will then, like the locomotive train pull us along, and out of that, out of being attached to the vine, the fruit will come up where we will overcome sexual immorality, where we will have love in our life because it flows from a place of abiding in Christ. This leads me to the second point, which is why is it crucial to walk by the Spirit? So there's two text that give reason in this, or two verses that give reason in this text to show us why is this something that's crucial in our lives to abide by the Spirit. I don't know about you guys, I tend to read the Bible a lot of times and go, is this something that's optional? Do I have to do this? Is this something that I can just kind of read and maybe not apply? And the reason why we have to ask this question, which is one of the most important questions, is to determine is this something that's crucial to living a life for Christ? And so there's two texts, or two verses, as I said. One is in verse 16, and the other is in verse 18. 
In verse 16, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the incentive for walking by the Spirit is that when you do this, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is a command with a promise. See, again, it's all the emphasis on the Spirit is the one that gives you power. This command is not, this verse is not saying, Juliana, you have to wake up today and deny the desires of the flesh. No, what this is saying is saying, walk by the Spirit, and my promise to you is my fulfillment to you is that you will be able to deny the, gratif- or the gratification of the desires of the flesh. And so this is a command, but it has a promise. Our p- command is to abide in the spirit and we will be able to overcome the desires of the flesh. So really quickly, I want to define really the flesh because when I struggled in looking at this text with trying to figure out what does he mean by the flesh, I think it's important that we try to understand what Paul is getting at when he talks about the flesh because in this verse that Carl read, there's a ton of descriptions of what the flesh is. The flesh is obviously sexual immorality, impurity, drunkenness, envy, discord. But I would say to you that Paul is actually showcasing symptoms of the flesh, not the actual, what he means by flesh. Meaning sexual immorality is a symptom of the disease. So what is the disease? I believe your flesh is the ego which feels an emptiness in you and uses the resources in its own power to try to fill it. Again, your flesh is an ego which feels the emptiness. How many of us have woken up and felt like we don't feel important enough? We don't have the love in our lives we need. We don't have enough money. The emptiness that comes in all of us. And the flesh is one that uses its own resources, doesn't care about the collateral damage, doesn't care how it affects anyone else because it's surely, it's purely hedonistic and surely just about you. It uses its own resources and its own power to try to fill, fill it. Another way to say this is the flesh is the capital I who tries to satisfy you with anything but God. So how we got here is if you look at Galatians 5.24, It says, those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we go back a few chapters into Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in um, the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the flesh here in Galatians 2.20 is more talking about the physical flesh, your body, it's your existence. It's not talking about the passions and desires. The reason why I got to the point of saying this is about the ego and the capital I, because in my research and in looking at what other people have said, if you look in verse or chapter 5, verse 24, it says, those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh. But if you look at Galatians 2.20, what has been crucified in Galatians 2.20? It's the I, it's the, your desires, it's who you are, and that's what we're laying down is our desires every single day. See, guys, the flesh is the ego which fills an emptiness but loathes the idea of satisfying it by faith. Instead, the flesh prefers to use its own resources and own power to fill its emptiness. In Romans 8, 7 says that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. See, if you want to know, how do I know if I'm living for the flesh or if I'm living for the spirit? The mark or the basic mark of the flesh is that it is unsubmissive. It does not want to submit to God's absolute authority or rely on God's absolute mercy. See, when I read this scripture and I go sexual immorality, drunkenness, envy, discord, hate, all those are obvious. But the desires of the flesh can be less obvious in your life. For me, it could be music. I remember a point in my life where it was music, where there's nothing inherently wrong with music. But I wanted to be a musician so bad 
that I allowed the music to be the authority in my life that guided my moral compass, that guided my decisions, and that's when music became a work of the flesh and not a work of the Spirit. See, Paul gives us an obvious list of things that all of us would agree with, but the ones that are more challenging are the less obvious, the ones where we're choosing our own desires. You could choose to love and it not be a holy, good, righteous love. It could be a love fully just that you're giving to get satisfaction for who you are and and your accomplishments and what you want to accomplish in your life. So it's key that we understand that this flesh is anything we put above Christ. So going back to what's the second reason that Paul gives us that says this is crucial to walk by the Spirit? The first is that walking by the Spirit, the promise is we will then have the power to overcome the desires of the flesh. The second is if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And sorry, my notes got a little turned around here. So the second reason is to walk by the Spirit or you, and you will not be under the law. See, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. This does not mean you do not have to fulfill God's law. So my struggle in this, in everybody's struggle, is we don't have to obey the law. We can now go out and do whatever we want. We still have to fulfill the law. That's what verse 13 and 14 said when it was saying, through love, be servants to one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Romans 8, 3 through 4 says, God condemns sin in the flesh in order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, what this is saying right now is God is condemning sin in the flesh because he is fulfilling the law. But how does he do that? In us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Therefore, not being under the law does not mean we don't have to fulfill the law. It means that when we are led by the power of the Spirit, going back to this analogy of like a train and Christ pulling us along, when we're led by the power of the Spirit, we cruise on this railroad track, for lack of a better word, of the law that is more joyful, that I hate to say is easier, but is that is more freeing in our lives. And it's not something that we're climbing this mountain and trying to do on our own. When we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the punishment or the oppression of the law because what the law requires, the Spirit produces. See, if you notice in verse 22, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the first one being love. And if we go back in Galatians 5 to to verse 14, you'll see that the whole law is fulfilled by love. See, and to confirm kind of what Paul is thinking here, he ends the list of the fruit of the Spirit in verse 23 with the words that say, against such there is no law. So what he's saying here is that how can you be under the oppression of the law? How can you be under the guilt of the law if you are in the Spirit? Because what the Spirit produces is love, joy, peace, the things that the law requires. So when you're in the spirit, there's no way to be under the law because your life is producing the things that the law requires. So this really should lead us to, all right, Luke, we understand that what walking by the spirit is is not on us. It's the emphasis. It's God's power pulling us along. Why it's crucial is because it will empower us to overcome the desires of the flesh and most importantly, We're not now under the pressure and and oppression of the law. But how do we actually do this in our lives? How do we walk by the Spirit in our lives? I want to walk us through a couple verses that I believe will showcase to us what Christ is looking for when he's requiring us to walk by the Spirit and how we actually do it. The point I would want to make is that the Spirit reigns over the flesh in your life. So how to do this? The Spirit reigns over the flesh in your life when you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you and is now working everything together for your good. 
So the main point I want to make as we walk through these verses is that the key indicator here is that the Spirit reigns over the flesh in your life when you live by faith. The key practical application for you as you leave here and you live your life is this living by faith. First, Galatians 5, 6 that I have on the screen. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. See, genuine faith will always produce love. Genuine faith will always produce love. And if you looked at Galatians 5.22, it says love is a fruit of the Spirit. So if love is what faith produces, and love is a fruit of the Spirit, then the way to walk by the Spirit is to have faith. So I want to share that with you again so I don't miss you, is if love, if we learn in Galatians 5.6 that the only thing that counts is faith expressing genuine love. And love is the fruit of the Spirit. Then in order to walk in the Spirit, you must have faith. Because faith is what will produce that love. Galatians 5.22 says, Love is a fruit of the Spirit. Sorry, Galatians 5, 5, for through the Spirit, by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. So how do we wait for Jesus in this verse? We wait for Jesus through the Spirit, but how? By faith. The point I'm trying to drive home is that in the first verse, we see that it's faith that produces love. In the second verse that I'm reading, Galatians 5, 5, we see that it's by faith that our hope is built, and that we're waiting for Jesus. And if we go to Galatians 3.23, now before faith, we were confined under the law. Meaning, the coming of our faith liberates a person from being under the law. So what does Galatians 5.18 say that we read? If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. How then shall we seek to be led by the Spirit? By faith, by meditating on the promises of God, by faith is how we should be led by the Spirit. And because we see in Galatians 3.23, now before faith came, we were confined by the law. Then we see Galatians 5.18 making the promise that if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So this, how then shall we seek to be led by the Spirit? By faith. And then Galatians 3.5 I think is probably the most clear, is does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, the Spirit does his mighty work in us and through us only by the hearing of faith. We are sanctified alone by faith. The way to walk by the Spirit and not fulfill the desires of the flesh is to hear the promises of God and trust Him and rest in Him. And then finally, we can consider Galatians 2.20, which is, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Who is the Christ who lives in Paul? that's being talked about in this verse. He is the Spirit. Galatians 4, 6 says, the Spirit of God's Son has been sent into our hearts. And so now, according to Galatians 2, 20, what Paul is seeing is that how does Paul walk by the Spirit of the Son? We see here that he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, the life, the new life that I now live, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, the point I'm trying to make when reading all of these passages is there's a common theme that in walking in the Spirit and abiding in the Spirit comes through faith. And I put this up on the screen, this first, because my mind immediately raced to, okay, in order to walk by the Spirit, I need faith that will produce a genuine love. How do I build my faith? And this is really the application. If there's any application for this message, it's this. 
is that how do you build your faith? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The point being made here in this scripture is that it's impossible for us to overcome the desires of the flesh alone. It's impossible for us to even walk in the spirit. What we have to do is lean on Jesus to lead us in the Spirit, to guide us in the Spirit, and we have to lean on Him to direct us. And how do we do that? We do that by our faith, by stepping out our faith. And where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. And so very practically, when you look at your life and you wake up tomorrow morning and your feet hit the floor on Monday, and you're thinking to myself, how do I abide in the Spirit? And maybe you're thinking, no one cares about me. I'm alone. When you abide in the word of God, which builds your faith, you can then read, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that scripture there can overcome that fear in your life. Or maybe the fear in your life that you hit the floor is, hey, I don't understand why this evil is happening to me in my life. These bad things are happening to me in my life. But yet the scripture says, God works everything together for your good, for the people who love him and keep his commandments. So the point here is that the only way we can abide in the spirit is not waking up and having a checklist of all the sins of sexual immorality, impurity, drunkenness, envy, the list goes on and on, and trying to check the list to go, I'm not gonna do that today. I'm not gonna do that today because you will fail. You will fail, and you will end up in a state of depression. The point here is that you can't even love. You can't even wake up and genuinely love, genuinely forbear, genuinely practice the fruit of the Spirit. What your job is, is to wake up every single day and submit yourself to Christ through faith, and how you do that is by opening up your Scripture, reading what he shares with you, praying, communing with him, and through his word, he will empower you. That's the picture he gives us with about abiding in the, in the vine and you're the branch. We don't produce the fruit on our own. It's when we abide in Christ every single day, when we abide in his word every single day, that all of a sudden, I'll be able to overcome sexual immorality. And it will be because of the power that Christ gave me through the Spirit in abiding in his word. I'll be able to practice true love, to practice true joy, because I abided in the word and he filled that with me. So the application and challenge to everybody in this room is that we are free from the law. We don't have to wake up every day and do a checklist of the rights and wrongs to earn our salvation. Our one command is to, by faith, abide in Christ, and he will produce the fruit. He will help us overcome the flesh. So let's go before the Lord in prayer.